Well, um, let's see. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you very good of you to have me here and uh, to, to give to for this very enjoyable visit. And uh, I will, I have, as, as Greg mentioned, I gave a, a hard condensed matter talk yesterday, which was, uh, you know, sort of detailed a lot of our work. Today, I will try my best to, to sort of balance between a talk with content and something that is accessible to the to the broader audience and uh, we'll see you know sort of you know the, the the art of the colloquium is something we all strive toward and uh, it's just some sort of asymptotic uh, notion um, so the idea what what would so there's this 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 colloquium brings across um, ideas from actually several fields of, of, of research one is conventional uh, uh, condensed matter research or modern what, what people call quantum condensed matter research which is broadly defined in the area of strongly correlated um, electrons and complex condensed matter but also brings in ideas from optics nonlinear optics and quantum optics and uh, I will try to sort of give you you know there's there, there's many things that at times are a bit subtle and I will so you will Forgive me because I've, I think I've, uh, 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 you know, sometimes things are perhaps more simpler than they should be for anybody who's expert in any one of the of these things. So uh, those of you the expect, who expect to learn something perhaps should go to another talk. Um, right, let's see. So let's start from the very, very basic idea of what we think in, in, in terms of uh, complex condensed matter. So this is the, our conventional view of a solid. This is what we all learn in school. So we think about uh, independent often, you know, by and large, most solids, the electronic properties of most solids are, um, are discussed in terms of independent electrons. What we know is that when the electrons are independent, say some periodic potential, what they want to do is to delocalize as much as they can. They wanna, they wanna, they wanna spread out and this helps them minimize their kinetic energy. And that's, that's what a single particle does. And the, the, they, they, you know, they, they disperse and they have a parabolic dispersion. And there, there are, on top of this, there are effectively uh, allowed and non-allowed electronic modes of the solid. So this defines bands and band gaps. And this is effectively an interference effect. I, you can think of this as some sort of cavity in which by interference some, at some, at some uh, uh, energies or some, or, are not, or some frequencies for the electrons are not allowed. And this is really what has guided us through the electronic revolution. We, 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 built, we built transistors and devices and all sorts of you know, uh, modern uh, things uh, based on this notion of, of, uh, of non or weakly correlated condensed matter. And, and what, I, what I can do you know, if I have this idea of a solid which tells me you know when something is a metal or a semiconductor or or a um, or an insulator effectively what i can do is then i can add interactions on top of this view and what interactions will do with it is they will change a little bit the parabolic shape effectively that parabola will look a little different when once i add interactions but by and large i can extrapolate from the behavior of a single particle to the behavior of the many and, and this, as I said, allows us to, 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 to predict and to control the properties of solids like silicon or gallium arsenide, etc. So, uh, there's, however, I mean, this has been known for a long time. There's, there's for example, oxides of some metals and, and some materials have always looked a bit strange. In, and, you know, already, I think, in the 1920s and 1930s, people realized that that, for example, uh, once, when one looked at materials like that, that contained transition metal oxides where the, where the unfilled shells were d electrons rather than, say, p electrons, so more localized orbitals or even f electrons, um, th these materials behaved a little differently. And, and the idea is that because the, these orbitals are, are much more localized on each site, the, 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 the over, they overlap much less, and which means that the tunneling amplitude, the, the probability with which an electron hops, or the speed with which an electron hops from one side to another is very much reduced. Um, at the same time, if one tries to occupy, when, when, when electrons spend uh, uh, um, time, when two electrons spend time on the same site, because the charge is more localized, the repulsion that these electrons uh, uh, experience is much higher. And so, effectively, this is, you know, 
the, the fact that the gaining kinetic energy is, 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 or the kinetic energy of the particles is small and that the Coulomb repulsion is high, in, in some limit can lead to a, what we, a fractionally filled system, which means something with unpaired electrons that normally we think of as a, as a metal, being an insulator. And in a sense, you know, this is, uh, let's see, this is, the, this is how we, you know, one should think of, you know, almost sort of, sort of a child's view of an insulator. Uh, this is actually fa a far simpler insulator to understand. If you, if, you, if you take somebody that doesn't know physics and you ask them why would a system would have, like, why would electrons in a system not conduct, you could think of just simply Coulomb repulsion. So the electrons are sort of localized on each side and they try to hop, but they can't because of the Coulomb repulsion. Okay, so this is, in a sense, a far easier concept than, uh, than, the, than, the, than the semiconductor or the insulator where you have these forbidden gaps and, and you have to think about interference and really quantum mechanics. So this is almost like a classical view. However, it turns out that a system like this uh, is a far more nonlinear system in the sense that the, 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 these correlations lead to, a collective, to collective phenomena that are uh, you know, uh, extremely difficult to predict uh, 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 mathematically, and that also have a lot of surprises. Okay, so this, the fact that you have strong effective interactions, these particles do not move independently, but, they, but their collective properties are really surprising. Okay, so and this really gives, you know, if, if really massive consequences. What I'm plotting there is what we usually, the way we understand these, 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 these materials is by plotting the phase diagram. Typical phase diagram will be something like that, where I, I plot the temperature on this axis and, and the stoichio some stoichiometry. So let's say the number, of, the number of holes in electrons that I have close to the Fermi level in the material. And unlike in the uncorrelated systems, I have a whole zoology of phases. If I change a parameter just by a wee bit, I will go from a metal to an insulator and the conductivity will change by seven orders of magnitude and the magnetism will change and sometimes the system will become superconducting and, and there's, really what we, there, there's really all these very complex collective properties that, that appear. Uh, so there's this, this very interesting concept or, or, or physics of the metal insulator transition, uh, what we call colossal magnetic resistance. So uh, in some of these, of these materials, there's, there's, you know, if you say apply a, a magnetic field, what you will have is that the, the changing in transport properties may change by many, many, many orders of magnitude, although the perturbation applied by a, given by a, by a DC magnetic field is on a very small energy scale. And then high temperature superconductivity, which will come later on in my talk. So these are really sort of these highly nonlinear systems that appear to be unstable against all sorts of all sorts of perturbations. So so somehow if I have to think about this what, what we call this complex uh, materials, uh, so the the, the the issue is that these strong correlations create collective giant responses. The material the materials are not only very sensitive, almost chaotic in their sensitivity to the, to the, to the boundary conditions. Um, and, and these responses are often functionally very relevant. You know, in print, I would like to build switches and, and do all sorts of things, make memories and, and et cetera. And, and one of the grand goals, really, f of, of materials research is to try to optimize the properties of these materials to do things that I like, make them do things that I like. Um, also, okay, so the other thing that I said, you know, whoops, that's not what I wanted to say. Uh, the fact that there are so many competing phases and that the, that the collective properties of the system uh, um, can, can vary for small perturbations also means that a material in any given state is always a failed something else. You can think of, in the same way that a liquid, let's say, is a failed a uh, superheated solid in the sense that there is a superheated solid hidden behind a liquid. Um, I can think of, you know, in some phase diagram, I can think of some, 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 some energy surface or free energy surface in which the material occupies uh, the, its true ground state, but then there is some, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole landscape of the energy and, there, and there's these hidden phases that they may or may not be accept, accessible. But, and, and when I try to control them, okay, so what, what I would like to do is really to bias 
uh, uh, these pockets of free energy and make one the true ground state of the system. That's, in a sense, the way I can think about uh, uh, traditional materials control. Um, and again, uh, let, me, let me sort of emphasize what's really remarkable is that all these phases, they are so vastly different, uh, effectively compete and fight it off on, on uh, very similar energy scales. And so that's, that's another sort of uh, 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 characteristic of this. So, so, so traditionally, our, our, I, I, our, yes, thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> what we try to do is to optimize one particular property or to control one particular property statically. What I can do is, for example, this is again my phase diagram, and this is the chemical doping. I change the stoichiometry of, of, of the solid, or I can apply static pressure that squashes the material and changes the lattice constant and changes the tunneling amplitude, or it changes some bond angle. I can apply a magnetic field. What a magnetic field will do is, for example, quench, you know, make superconductivity or will make electrons go in orbit. Uh, superconductivity unfavorable will make electrons go in orbit and change the properties. I can apply electric field. This is typically a non-equilibrium type uh, stimulus. But, but by and large, the idea is, is that I can apply a static uh, perturbation, and the static perturbation biases this, this sort of uh, you know, Mickey Mouse picture of a, of a, of a, of a free energy surface and makes a, you know, a competing state favorable. When, you know, typically what we do is we take a superconductor and we would like to know what's behind the superconductor. We apply a magnetic field, we quench the superconducting state, and we look at the system in its failed. And what, what we're doing by applying a magnetic field is making, you know, this would be the opposite, but I'm, I'm making the, the non-superconducting state becoming the, 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 the global minimum of the system. Uh, the, 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 our research is really aimed at trying to uh, uh, explore control of these materials uh, dynamically. So one of the things, so what we would like to do is really to try to switch between phases rapidly or to use dynamical perturbations to, 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 to do this. So a zero order notion, and this is what I talked about yesterday, would be something where you would use a light field and you force and you force the system to, to cross a kinetic barrier that may be on some energy scale that, for example, you cannot reach with pressure or magnetic field. But say you can use uh, 200 millev light, which is 2,000 degrees or something, 3,000 degrees. And, and, I can, and I can explore these, uh, these, um, the, 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 you know, these, these new states. More interestingly, and this is, this is really something that I talked about yesterday, what I would like to focus on today are situations in which maybe even I have a unique ground state of the system, or close by I have a unique ground state of the system, but I can, I can turn on a time-dependent perturbation. And if I think about the, the system being driven, uh, this, this creates a new, 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 new collective properties. So I don't think about the solid by itself, but I think about, say, a, a solid plus a time-dependent field, and I can think of some sort of effective Hamiltonian for the whole, for the whole problem, and, and this will make create new, new states. So, so let's say, uh, let's let's see. Let me let me explain what I what I mean. Um, <coughs> this is the famous Kapitza pendulum. Um, so let's take here on the right hand side. I take a pendulum. You know, we, we all know what a pendulum does. It has one stable position and, and one unstable position. But now I apply a time dependent perturbation, and what I do is I shake the pivot point of the pendulum at a frequency that is high compared to the eigenfrequency of the pendulum. If the frequency is low compared to the eigenfrequency of the pendulum, I get side bands. But if the frequency is high, I, I, have an effective Hamilton, I have an effective energy surface with a minimum of potential here, which is narrower than this minimum of potential, and a minimum of potential here. And so I can, I can, I can, I can hold it upright. This is one example of a, dynamically, of a dynamical system that just looks different from, from a static system. There's lots, I mean, there's lot, I, I was, I actually, this thing, I, I tried to list a bunch of things, and it turned out that I had put like 10, and I would have put you all to sleep. But um, let me make another couple of examples. This is the, the, the example of the quadrupole, or ion traps. Typically, people put, you know, you, put, you, want, you want to trap an ion, in, and you want to put quadrupoles there, but, you know, we know from electrostatics that if you don't have charges, you cannot have a confining potential. So if you, if you have, if you, sorry, if you have some multipolar field, you will have a saddle point. 
But now what, the, what, the, what these people came up with, so this is, comes from Wolfgang Paul's Nobel lecture, but you know, the, uh, you know what, the, what they do is they, they, make, they add it in a, a, a AC modulation to the, to the multipolar fields, and effectively what they do is they make the saddle point rotate. And so the particle will feel a trapping potential only because I have an AC perturbation. Again, another example of where I can, where I can, I can stabilize one particular state of a physical state by modulation. In condensed matter physics, this is something we were talking about at dinner last night. You, you can take what we call the systems that exhibit uh, uh, quantum Hall effects, and you can and 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 you can you can uh, add a. Um, so these are these are sort of I, I won't go into the details, but these are these are sort of edge uh, states where in, which in a magnetic field uh, have edge condu conduction um, in in two dimensional high mobility gases. And you can apply an AC modulation in microwave frequencies and find zero resistance states. Again, something that can only happen in presence of AC modulation. So you get the point. There's all sorts of, there's all sorts of fun stuff that happens in, 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 in the dynamical world. Okay? So another uh, really important conceptual analog to all the condensed matter physics that I will tell you about is come up in the last few years in the physics of optical lattices. What people have started doing in, say, beginning of 2000s uh, has been to use, to make effective potentials by interfering laser fields and putting atomic gases or BEC condensates or things like that in these gases. And they have simulated the strongly correlated electron physics that I've been telling you about at the very beginning and by, by, by changing the laser, effectively the laser strength. What they, what they can do is, you know, they make a potential, imagine this is the potential of your, of your ionic potential that I discussed at the beginning. If I, increase the, if I increase the laser strength, the tunneling will go down, and if I reduce the laser strength, the tunneling will go up. So I can, I can, I can sort of control the ratio between the kinetic energy of the particles and the correlation. And this allows you to simulate in a very clean environment with very little dissipation all this physics of mod insulators that we normally see in rusts of, of nickel, which are really messy systems in which it's very difficult to distill this model Hamiltonian physics. And so this has been really, um, in a sense, well, different people have got different opinions about this, but in my view, this has really allowed us to think about many problems, different problems perhaps than the ones we think about in condensed matter physics in a very lucid way. And so this is actually something very interesting that happens at the interface between quantum optics and, co and condensed matter. This is what I just told you. Uh, yes. There's an essential distinction between the last thing, which is just s simulating a thermodynamics, Quite. a Hamiltonian Quite, system, yes. and what you did before, which had no Hamiltonian. Yes. Associated. All right. Let me. Let me just. One slide more, and hold that thought for a second. This is, of course, all static. We're back to Th this last this last one, right? But I can also, okay, this is I'm repeating what I just told you. What I can also do is, do, is shake the lattice. Once you once I've set the lattice, I can put an acousto-optic modulator or something on my laser, and I can give you a driving. This is going to all make you dizzy, so I'm going to stop this. <laughs> but I can start studying what the particles are doing and sort of try to look at what we call the emergent properties of the system. This many-body soup, you know, the, all the, that, that you know will behave in a, in, a, in a particular way in the presence of an AC potential. So there's there's actually energy scales aside. This is slow, low temperature low energy scales, a lot of con conceptually, these, these can be sometimes very similar. And this is something that we take very seriously. So my, our own work is about using light pulses at higher energy scales and, for, and drive particular, say, for example, vibrations or particular excitations of the solid with a, with a, with a, with a light beam. So the question we will ask is if I take this, which is some cube, superconducting cube ray, and I come with a light field that is made resonant with one particular vibration, and I keep it on, what will the collective properties of the system be? This is a problem that, you know, it's, a, it's somehow a crisp experimental question, but it, it, has, it has very non-trivial answers and sometimes very surprising results. So that's kind of the whole talk, this thing here. So you have a short pulse, but... No, that's long, sorry. That's yeah. a long pulse. I just short pulse just because I'm sloppy. I, I, I didn't, yeah. That's short, long, whatever you want. Yeah, this is some, right. Okay, well, the one important point is that 
we can't, to do this, what I just told you, you can't use conventional lasers. So you can't use visible lasers, which are, you know, sometimes you can't work on 1 EV energy scales. And this is because the physics you care about is on, is on thermal energy scale. So all, everything that I, that, that, I want you, that, that, that I want to talk about are modulations at terahertz frequencies. One terahertz, right, important scale. One terahertz equals 4.4 milliV equals 50 Kelvin. Room temperature is six terahertz. Uh, so all important collective excitations of condensed matter that we care about, that are functionally relevant and that occur in, in, in real life, uh, uh, you know, and not in plasma physics or in the interior planets or something, occurs on sort of terahertz, at terahertz frequency. So that's really something that we, we put a lot of energy into trying to develop strong field perturbations that can shake the constituents of matter at their eigenfrequency, at their natural frequency. What we would like to do is drive them to large amplitudes backwards and forwards, but we don't want to, you know, one way to think about one EV excitation will be you go to the Kapitza pendulum and you, and you snip it. So that, you know, that's maybe not the best thing to do. Right, so, okay, so I am just very briefly touching on something I talked about yesterday. So I thought whether I should tell you this thing again, but I'm not going to tell you again because some of you were here already. One, you know, so everything I talked about yesterday was this idea of nonlinear phonon excitation. We take, we take some materials, again, terahertz pulse at many megavolt per centimeter fields. And, the, and I can take, let's say I'm at zero temperature where there's some quantum fluctuation or not even, let's even think that there's no quantum fluctuations. And then I come and I shake a phonon at, at very large amplitudes. And then that's, this, these are the experiments. And, and so this is, you know, I'm thinking about my, my, my bet. We, when we did this, we call this nonlinear phononics. And this is because the way we think about the, 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 you know, the, the way we drive these modes and the way these modes coupled with other modes can be, can, be, can be straightforwardly, or not straightforward, but it can be sort of naturally connected to nonlinear optics. The way I take an infrared laser and I throw it, and I throw it into a nonlinear material and I make a blue light field. So that's the that's the idea. So and and again, I'm going to tell you two things that I already said yesterday. The key point of this is the following: that what we have been working on over the past few years, uh, starting with this paper, we demonstrated the effect about nonlinear phononics is how you can take a single pulse and drive one particular mode, and by virtue of unharmonic, coupling, unharmonic couplings, I can also couple to other modes, but somehow steer the mechanical energy throughout the, the, a subset of modes and control individual bonds in the crystal selectively. What I want to do, what I want to do is the following. Let's take sort of a classical example in uh, uh, hard condensed matter physics. This, this Stoichiometry doesn't tell you anything, but this is like the ba one of the basic realization of the mod insulator. This is, these are materials with only 1D electron cl close to the Fermi level, so these are sort of uh, a half-field system. And if you take strontium vanadate, which happens to be the square where here's the transition metal and here are the oxygens and here are the dopants, and this bond is straight, the, the, the electrons like to hop and they tunnel freely, so the, the speed that, at which the electrons tunnel is very high. Therefore, this material is a metal and it's a vegetable. It really looks like almost like copper. If I go, then I can go to calcium vanadine, lanthanum titanate, you know, details aside, these, these materials are exactly the same. If I go to yttrium titanate, I can, I can bend this by say five degrees. This is an insulator with a three EV gap. And so, in, in principle, what I would like to do is control this single bond, go in there with my finger and move it up and down, and switch between a metal and an insulator. And so that's what nonlinear phononics is good for, or what we would like it to be good for. I want to just bond, I want to drive a structural phase transition by selecting one single bond and just tell the material to go there. Okay? Um, so that's kind of another simple uh, idea of how, you know, this is the, this is, what was that, St uh, lanthanum titanate, and we make it more like uh, strontium vanadate, and we can drive transitions. And over the past few years, we've been doing actually quite a lot of this. Again, yesterday I talked about, so this is some of the first experiments here where we, 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 we in, in, in other material similar to this, uh, in, in, in prosodymium manganite, we went from an insulator to a metal. Here we went to into, from a non-superconductor to a superconductor. This is also where we saw superconductivity at temperatures far, very close to room temperature. 
transiently. And this is something that is coming out tomorrow or the day after tomorrow about other things. Anyway, but uh, this is the first area of research that has been sort of traditionally our, let's see if I can beat my chest, our, our sort of uh, uh, area of, of, of more, more, more success. What comes up now is going to be a cross-section of some of ideas that we have at the moment. These are projects that are kind of up in the air, but are nevertheless quite exciting, and I think it's perhaps uh, a useful exercise to expose you to the way we're thinking and why these things may be uh, exciting and interesting. Okay, second problem. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Depends on the kinetic barrier. Okay, so in principle, let's say you do this experiment at one Kelvin in a glassy system, yeah? This kinetic barrier will be far above any fluctuation at low temperature, so you can quench in some competing state. What do you mean by, sorry, what does that mean? What you do is... Then it stays, it stays there. there. It, stays it stays there. If the temperature is low enough and the kinetic barrier is high enough, it just stays stuck there, although that's not, its, uh, that's not where it would like to be, but it just doesn't explore the other. The other things. So, what is, for, what this is, is the scale of like how many uh, of these cells are you? Hundred percent. What? Hundred percent. Right, but how? In many a good is day, yeah. What's how that? How many atoms are involved? Like ten to the twenty-three per cubic centimeter. Okay, so yeah. Right, but I mean, it's a macroscopic amount. Of this it's a, like a piece of brick, like this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's a, it's like five hundred microns by one micron. It's a, you know, it's yeah. kind of a. Big enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is light. Light with 300 micron radiation wavelength and penetration depths of several microns and, and, and you know, spot sizes of a millimeter. It depends how much field you have and, and it depends on the details, right? So it's, uh, but anyway, yeah, this is, would be, this is a collective macroscopic transition where all the molecules go from, right? Uh, yes. I mean, isn't this a little uh, misleading? You're also changing the Hamiltonian, so you're re reducing the you're, you're uh, this changing the ground state. You come with a pulse, then you turn off the pulse, uh, and then the system goes back to its own Hamiltonian. It just happens to be in the wrong microstate. In the case where I'm quenching, where I'm, where I'm sort of, I get trapped in the, the... Whilst the pulse is stimulating the material, obviously the whole Hamiltonian, I mean you have an HI as well, you have an interaction term in the Hamiltonian, but when the pulse is gone, so then you are where you are. In principle, very often you come back if the temperature is high enough and then you go back to your ground state after some kinetic time, right? But so this picture is after you've turned it over. Yes, yes. No. That is actually, can I say something? Yes, you're right. This is actually misleading because whilst, this, whilst the material is, ex, is, is exploring this transition path, the, 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 the free energy surface changes, whatever free energy means out of equilibrium. But it's, uh, yeah, yeah, but good point taken, yes. I mean, can you get things like Rabi oscillations with this, or is it too inhomogeneous? To, to you know, that's very interesting. I've, so lots of people ask me this question at talks, and um, I mean, what you're saying is that you have a state here and, an, and another state here, and you... Turn it on, and it just coherently goes back and forth between the two. Yeah, so um, there is a case that I've not shown to you. Um, the closest I can think of is Josephson oscillations, where you sort of oscillated between a metallic and a superconducting state. But that's maybe cheating, because, but in a sense, it's almost like Rabi oscillations between two, between two states. Okay, but, and yeah, may, perhaps. Perhaps, if the, st if, if the state is very quantum, yes. Right. Okay, so this is again cross-section of things, you know, very sort of uh, things that I'm interested in. So now let's take this material, erbium ferrite. This is a multiferroic, which means that, that it's a material in which you have magnetic order, but the, the order there's also a structural order parameter, so it's a ferroelectric uh, uh, phenomenon, and these two order parameters are coupled. And, and, and the reason why these are very interesting is that, in principle, what you can do is you can try to manipulate the magnetism by using electric fields. That's why people are interested in it. But what we would like to, so this is the, the forget the details. There's, the, this is what we call a canted antiferromagnet, which means that on two sides, the spins are effectively 
uh, pointing toward one another, but because there is, a, there is some spin orbit coupling, some one particular type of spin orbit coupling, which we call the jelosinski maria interaction, this, the, the spins don't quite point onto one, uh, toward one another, but they, are, but they are tilted. And therefore, along this axis, there is a finite magnetization. Okay? That's, and what I would like to, and so what I would like to do, and this is good because when, the, when, you know, if there's a particular magnetization along one axis, I can use this to write and read the magnetic information in it, okay? Uh, what I would like to do is to use light and, and kind of control this magnetization. I want to rotate it, spin it forward, backwards at fast speeds, and I would like to do this in a non-dissipative way. I would like to reduce the amount of entropy that I put in the system every time I flip the spin so that I can flip it back without, you know, and I don't have to wait too long between the two, okay? Of course, now a light field of the type I used before, I told you before, doesn't work because a light field only breaks inversion symmetry and doesn't break time reversal symmetry. So a straight linearly polarized light field won't, won't cut it. So then we kind of thought about this a little bit and, and, and this is what we came up with. If you look at this material from the top, Let's think about modes. These, these are, there's, there's these modes which we call B1, B2, B3. These are almost degenerate modes along the different axes. And so this is the, if the light, if I look from the top and let's say I excite with light polarized along this plane, I have one particular eigenmode of the system. And then I can flip the light and there will be the B3U mode, which happens to be almost like the B2U mode, but because of details has a slightly different frequency and slightly different eigen eigenvectors, and I can also excite that along a different axis. And now what I can do is I can take two lasers that are synchronized with one another. I put one along this axis and one along that axis. Okay, let's see if this works. And I can, and I can, this is kind of fun, I think. And what I can do is I can excite this guy pi half out of phase from this guy. Okay, so I'll have, there is only one particular mode and then the, and, and the other one. So what, what, the, what the net motion of both modes, which are pi half out of phase with one another, will be. So those, those modes are the same frequency as No, they're not because they're B, otherwise it would be E. They're singly degenerate modes. Doesn't matter, they're not. But then they won't be always the same. Pi. Yeah, I'll get to that, yes. Yeah, so they will start circularly polarized and then they will dephase. Okay. Okay, so this is kind of a... Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Maybe you can do interesting things with them. So, okay, this is actually a point of honor because otherwise I could put just a quarter wave plate and make the light circularly polarized. But in reality, I can take different modes and now for short times I can mix them. This is, kind of, this is really not linear phononics. I can take, you know, one light of one color, one light of the other color with two polarizations and I can mix them. So, uh, right. That's why I didn't use the word circularly polarized yet. Okay. All right, so the motions will be of the following type. In this particular case, which is erbium ferrite, um, what you will have is that the oxygens will do this and the irons will do the other thing. And actually, I now my student did the following thing and he kind of collapsed everything on the same center. And so look, look at this. This is the oxygen that moves, the oxygen two minus moves clockwise, so I have a two minus charge that moves clockwise at 20 terahertz frequency, and I have an iron charge, which is some, let's say it's probably three plus, uh, which moves in the other direction, counterclockwise, which means that there's one... one is the red and the other is the blue. One, I forgot which one, well the light one will be the large one. Let's say the red, the red is the oxygen and the iron, which is heavier, is the, is the other one, and they, and they propagate in different directions, so there's one magnetic field, right? There's, there's you know, there, there's there's a, I have a magnetic field in only, or magnetization in the system that threads the material. Okay, so we said, okay, that's great. So maybe if we do this, we can excite, we can, we can tip the magnetization. And so we did this experiment and, you know, um, so this is the experiment. These are pump probe experiments, the way we do them. You have a single pulse or pairs of pulses. They come, they stimulate the material. And then you have all this, this, this stuff that happens. And you have this magnetization that depends, as Tycho was saying, and this is a magnetization that depends on time. Because the circularly polarized nature of this thing will, will be time dependent if the two modes are not degenerate, right? And now what I can do is I can come with a second pulse, okay, time delayed with respect to the to this shaking pulse. Look at this is my animation. And I can measure the Kerr effect. And so this Kerr effect, if I take this rotation and I measure it with magnetic fields in two directions, 
tells me if there is a time-dependent magnetization in the system. And if I can excite some magnetic excitation, I should see it. I should see this rotation being a function of the relative time delay between the, the center of the pulse that is starting the rotation and, the, and, and my probe pulse. So sure enough, if you, you know, this is the response and there's phonons and there's all sorts of things that are being excited. But if you, if you look carefully and if we transform it, in the right temperature range, you see a very clear ma ma magnon excitation. This is, uh, what, this is this ferromagnetic magnon. Uh, what's called the antiferromagnetic mode, don't ask me why, this is called the AF mode, but it's, it's a mode of the right symmetry, it's of asymmetry, etc, etc, because you're mixing two B modes, and it goes, uh, it goes up and down. And in, so in, one, what, what one should try to find are systems where I can flip the magnetization and control this. These are very tiny, tiny motions. So that's what we called lattice rotonics, because this will look good on a title somewhere. But that's the, that's the idea of, of sort of you can, you can again go to zero temperature and, and decide that you're interested in this sort of this, this rotational motion. So I, I threw this in, okay, this is a magnetic control. Of course you want to rotate. Now what, what you, you, put, you put one mode pi half forwards from the first and your magnetization goes like so. And then you put the second mode pi, pi half backwards and the magnetization comes like so because the rotation will be inverted. So in principle you can control the complete state of polarization as a function of time. You know, in a world in which you can make any laser pulse with any shape of any chirp in any, in any spectrum, you could control completely the state of polarization of pairs of modes, okay? And in principle, you could come with a third pulse here and, and give complicated orbits, etc., etc. Another application that, that one could think of, and this is again something that comes from a conversation I've had, so I threw it together after talking with Aditi this morning. Um, so if you think about graphene, Graphene, very important uh, sort of two-dimensional material, is been is, is one of those like ultra-hyped systems in which you know they can do everything. They give a Nobel Prize for this. But the most important aspect of graphene is that it's a system that, because it has two completely equivalent sublattices, uh, exhibits bands that are linear, and it, uh, there is this sort of this idea of Dirac, of Dirac uh, uh, charges or Dirac carriers that, that carry um, charge at these you know close to these K points of the brittle end zone. And the other very nice thing is that the mobility of this material is extremely high. So in principle, we would like to make electronic devices with this, except that the material has got no gap. So you can't make a transistor with it. The same reason that gives you very high mobility takes away a band gap and it doesn't allow you to make a transistor. So there's a lot of interest in, in finding ways to open and close gaps in graphene whilst retaining this very high mobility of the carriers. So, what one can do is, for example, excite a single phonon, which breaks the, in equ the equivalence between the A, B sublattices. And what, what this thing will do is that it will open and close the band gap at twice the frequency of the phonon. Okay? So that seemed like a great idea at the beginning, but then it's, you know, you're really doing nothing on average for this. What you can do, though, is do the same thing as before, you take this mode and the other, the other, the other, these are degenerate modes, by the way, they have the same frequencies, they will stay circularly polarized. Uh, this mode has the same frequency as this. Uh, and so what this thing will do is that, you, this is called the Kekule mode, don't ask me why. What? Kekule mode. Oh, okay. uh -oh. oh, is that what it is? Kekule. Kekule mode. Okay, so, oh, all right, whoops. Okay, anyway, so, so what happens is that the atoms, you know, this goes like this, the other one goes like that, and, you, and what happens, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting things about the topological nature of, of this, this breaks time reversal symmetry in a, in a highly non-trivial way. This is things that, that, that uh, Aditi is working on. Um, but that's the idea, right? You, can, you, 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 break, you, break, uh, you break time reversal symmetry and you can open a gap, and that gap will stay open whilst you keep it pumped. So that's, that's, that's again, something we... Um, you know, it's kind of interesting, and, and we'll see how far we get with this. But that's, uh, these are experiments we're trying to do, and, and I won't tell you how you probe the gap. There's a lot of technology that I've decided to conceal from you in for sake of clarity. Um, all right, so that was the first part of the talk, and I hope you're content with the, with the style of, uh, of and, and, you, and, you, and you're following this, but I'm happy to slow down or accelerate if you find this too simple or vice versa. Right, okay. Hi, TC. This is my, you know, everybody in this field, you, they say they work on something else, but they work on high TC, really. They think about high TC. So high TC is this, is this very nice material. It's an oxide of copper, and it has this spectacular 
phenomenon whereby the resistivity that you know we know in, in superconductors the resistivity drops exactly to zero uh, and also most importantly there is uh, it, it, uh, static magnetic fields are completely expelled below a certain critical temperature and what was found is that in these materials high TC can happen at temperatures and, and energy scales of order room temperature this is sort of you know a third of room temperature so that's uh, that's uh, uh, really was a, was a, was a very remarkable achievement where in the 90, you know, in the late 1980s, this, this family of compounds was found that, you know, exhibited superconductivity as some, somewhere around minus 100 Kelvin. So this is, this is what, something I found on Wikipedia. I, said, I made this joke already yesterday. Those that have heard, they should laugh again. But it's it, that, that people really made room temperature superconductors under pressure in Antarctica. This is how sort of close we are to this. And the idea is that, you know, so, so it's really sort of a factor of two away from room temperature. And uh, there's applied reasons, but most importantly, the idea that I could make something that is a Bose-Einstein condensate or something similar to it at room temperature is really sort of a, intellectually one of the most exciting. Uh, it's sort of this collective quantum mechanical state that we're in, uh, uh, at room temperature. So this is really something that uh, motivates uh, all sorts of people for all sorts of reasons. So this is, again, a complex material for the same reasons that I told you before. This, this, this rust of copper tends to have strongly correlated electrons and all the zoology that I told you about. But there is one particular uh, uh, eff effect that I would like. So I won't concentrate on all this. Uh, some people say that in the, you know, in, in, if you look at this, 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 this uh, phase diagram, this is physics under the red dome and all the rest is chemistry. So that's, that's really but perhaps one way to think about it. This is really a highly complex system. But one important aspect of the physics of all this, comp all this complex uh, region of doping and temperature above TC is that there, 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 there is a growing body of evidence that, that, that posits the following. If I think about the superconducting state by thinking about its order parameter, the order parameter of a superconductor is a complex quantity that has a, an amplitude which is some number that is related to the number of pairs that participate in this condensate. And it has a gauge invariant phase. And, 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 and because of energetic considerations, the system wants to lock. You don't want to have spatial gradients of the phase. That's something that costs energy. You don't want to have it. And this is the below TC state. On each plane, I will have order parameters. And this will be sort of, you know, ideally homogeneous all over space. And this will be, will be homogeneous. And, and, and this will happen both in the plane and outside the planes. As I said, there is, a, there is a, unlike conventional superconductors in which I can think of the transition between the superconducting state and the non-superconducting state as a situation in which the modulus of the order parameter collapses to zero, which means the number of Cooper pairs goes from n to zero, to following some second order uh, path. In, in high TC, there is actually a lot of, a lot of um, uh, uh, work that discusses the existence of local puddles of a finite Cooper pairs, so a finite amplitude of the order parameter, in which, however, the phase starts juggling, you know, starts becoming. So let's say that the, we can think of the system as a system that retains bosonic entity at temperatures higher than TC, but in which these bosons are not locked into one another, into, into, into. So, and that's, of course, if that's true, up to some temperature, and that's, again, we, we should, we, when, you know, uh, uh, different people will tell you different things about up to which temperature this thing happens. It could be three degrees above TC, it could be tw twice TC. But in principle, this is very exciting because if I have some Cooper pairs that are not being used, maybe there's something I can do about it. So what we would like to do, and this is really something that, is, that, is, that has uh, occupied my thoughts for a long time in the past couple of years, I mean a lot of my time for the past couple of years, is to use light to try to stabilize this phase. If I can stabilize the phase above TC with light, then maybe that's good. Maybe I can, I can really create a CW superconductor in a laser field. Wouldn't that be great? Right? And, and you can make a device, turn on the light, turn off the light, and then uh, manipulate it, etc. So there is act, the reason why I think that this is even conceivable is that there is a whole, there's an enormous amount of work in quantum optics uh, that actually comes from the LIGO uh, 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 technology in which cavities, optical cavities, are used to cool some degrees of freedom of macroscopic objects. The way this cooling of a, of a mechanical oscillator works is the following. This is a mirror that doesn't move. 
this is a mirror that can move backwards and forwards, and it moves backwards and forwards with some, you know, something that relates to its temperature. So there is some potential, and, and, and I have some longitudinal acoustic phonons that are populated, and, and they have a certain temperature, and this gives rise to some fluctuations. It, there's two counteracting uh, contributions to the energy in this cavity. There is light pressure that tends to squash the, the mirror away from the cavity, and there's the total energy of the cavity that goes down if the mirror moves. So what this does is that it creates a minimum of potential in the total Hamiltonian of the system, which tends to cool this degree of freedom. Okay? This is something that is being used in LIGO, where you use feedback to stabilize the interferometer, for example. And or at least the, some 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 equivalent to this. Yes. So, for this system to cool the little mirror, do you have to have you have to measure it and then uh -uh. adjust the light? No, the cavity. Is. The only important thing is that the Q that the that the that the Q factor of the cavity is of the right is right. So the material, the whole system is viscous. Okay. The cavity needs to respond slow compared to compared to this eigenfrequency. If you do this, the radiation pressure and the, and the, balance, uh, and the balance of the, of the energy of the cavity creates a minimum in which, the, in which this thing sits. And people, have, you know, there's, there's N magazine papers that talk about cooling this uh, down to its quantum mechanical ground state. And this, of course, because the K equals zero longitudinal acoustic phonons does uncouple to other modes very effectively. And so you can, you know, you can suck energy out and, you, and you'll be weakly coupled to a bath and, and so you can keep it into, in this non-equilibrium position. If you look at this, uh, and this is something that, you know, sort of I've been thinking of for a while, and you, instead of the, ca of the oh, no, I flipped the cavity this way, instead of the mirror, I take a cuprate superconductor with the tunneling, and I will tell you a little more about this, but, but the, with, the, with, the, with a particular polarization, it turns out that the superconducting phase can be mapped one-to-one -one onto the coordinate of the mirror. It's the same maths. So in principle, what I can do is a laser cavity that changes the superconducting phase here, which changes the optical properties, which reduces the energy in the cavity, which feeds back onto this, and cools down the phase fluctuations along the C-axis. It would take me half of a talk to tell you much more about this, so, so we'll just sort of proceed now. But that's really what we would like to do, and I will, and I will tell you, okay, um, I won't well, tell you this. You're not going to explain it, but what is it that you've done that's so exciting? This, what is the result of doing He's this? He's about to tell you. Oh, yes? I mean, I'm, uh, no, not, it hasn't worked yet. I'm telling you how we, what we're working on. Okay. About I'm about to tell you where we're going. There's a whole story. Yeah. Right. Excuse me? The phase is not periodic. The superconducting phase is homogeneous in the ground state and it's fluctuating close to the close to equilibrium in the same way that the mirror does. So the fluctuations are small? They're small. I mean in the order it's there. No. They're not. Absolutely. They will be, of course. At some point they will get very large. That's that's going to be one of the ten thousand problems to be thought of. Yeah, let me let me let's 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 let me tell you a few things that we're working on. We have some theory. We 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 are designing things to make this work, and we'll tell you how far we've gotten with this. I won't tell you this, and I won't tell uh, I won't tell you this either. Okay, what what I want to do is I will tell you something. <coughs> the manifestation of the superconducting order parameter phase in each one of the layers is a particular plasma edge that you see in the reflectivity that reflects the, 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 the tunneling between the tunneling between layers is reflected into the eigenfrequency of this mode and, and this width of this eigenfrequency tells you in, in, in some way how much the phase is fluctuating. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Let me, let me tell you, okay, we can get back to all the details. I want to bring a couple of points across. Possibility number one, how could we do this? I could, what we call anti-Stokes cooling. Let's think of a material that has a particular plasma frequency which is related to the phase fluctuations of the system and I come with a laser field at some frequency and then this laser field will scatter elastically so that's not very helpful and will scatter inelastically and there will be something that removes plasma and phase fluctuations from the system. This is the anti-Stokes 
uh, uh, scattering, and then there's something that adds fluctuations, and in equilibrium there's a detailed balance between the two, and, and, and I'm not neither heating nor cooling the system. In principle, what I can do is I can put a cavity around it and inhibit the heating beam, and I can tune the cavity resonance so that this system only sucks fluctuations. That's possibility number one. And, and, and it's, you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And maybe it will only happen, to go back, to, go back to, to, to your question, that we will just improve a superconductor below TC. The second thing that we've been thinking of, and this is something that we just published, for, I mean, this is kind of trivial, but, but the, that we actually, that is slightly more subtle, and we just published now, uh, we're, we're, we're about to publish with our theory colleagues in Oxford, is the following. If you consider a bilayer cuprate, in a bilayer cuprate, what one has are pairs of, 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 of junctions in which I have phases on each one of these phases, on, the, on each one of these planes, and then I have tunneling between this junction and this junction. This is because the structure is such that, is such that I, have lay, I have pairs of layers that are close and then other pairs of layers that are far away from, from it. And so I really have two plasma modes. And what, we, what, what, what we've been discussing for a long time is the following idea. If I can modulate the properties of the system at a frequency that is exactly the beat note frequency between the frequency of one plasmon and the frequency of the other plasmon, okay, what I have is a parametric transfer of fluctuations from one plasmon to the other. Okay, in absence of damping, what will happen is that I will take fluctuations from the weak plasmon put it in the, in, the, in the strong plasma, and then it will go back, and this will be a unitary sort of rotation of, 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 of entropy between the two. However, if I have a bath, and, and, and this is almost always the case that the strong plasma is much more coupled to the bath than the, than the weak plasma, what I will be able to, to build, and I'll get back to some of the results of the calculation, is effectively a Carnot fridge, where I put work in, I take fluctuations, and I throw them in the bath. And so I can suck out. That would be another thing that would be very nice. And when you do calculations in, 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 you know, in, in a basic model that we use in condensed metaphysics, which is the Lawrence Doniak model for, for these materials, and we use some Langevin description, I mean, they use, I don't, the, some Langevin description of the fluctuations, they can show how uh, if you plot some correlation function of the fluctuation, you are cooling the fluctuations of the weak junction at the expense of the fluctuations of the strong junction. Okay, so these are all sort of these ideas that we are working on. Now, the reason why this is a bit difficult, okay, and there's a lot of work that I, I you know, I, I've been struggling whether I should tell you all this. This is actually most of the stuff we do has been to use, uh, to study light uh, coupling to these plasma waves in the nonlinear regime, and we can, we, and there's actually all sorts of things that I won't tell you about. I'd be happy to discuss it with you later. The most, the, another point that I want to bring across, and this brings me to some, to, to some of the things that I think are very interesting in this field, is that if you want to be able to do either the anti-Stokes cooling, say the anti-Stokes cooling, what you need is a cavity in which the spacing between the different modes is large compared to the energy that you want to exchange in the scattering process. And that creates a problem because what you want is the, the, a cavity in which the free spectral range, which is the distance between these two modes, is much bigger than one terahertz, which means that the cavity must be much smaller than 300 microns. And that's, that's, that's the problem, right? That's why it's easy to cool LIGO, maybe it's not easy, but at least conceptually on, at this level you can make a large cavity, but in, in the case in which you have high frequency fluctuations, that's difficult to do. So I, and, and, and this is sort of bringing me toward the end of my talk, and as I said, there are only preliminary results, and, and, uh, and, and we were about almost to, block, to stop doing this uh, until my postdoc, Yanis Laplace, who's a very clever guy, came back and said, you know, in principle, what we could do is to use plasmonic techniques, uh, and, and what you can do is, for example, say for sake of argument, that, and I will get into more details, that you put gold and insulator in gold, and you can put patches of gold here on the top. What happens is that if you come with an electromagnetic field perpendicular to the, to the, to the, to the, to the structure, this will, couple, and this will behave as an array of cavities. This is sort of where, where plasmonic coupling allows you to have an array of cavity with the right Q vector. And this actually brings me to the next step, uh, which is this is where teaming up with a group in Geneva that grows uh, oxide heterostructures. Really what you need to do for this project uh, is to use this technology of thin film complex oxide growth uh, um, to, to create, to embed 
superconducting planes into insulating planes and into another metal and into, into this metal. So what you need is really index matched, uh, sorry, not index matched, uh, uh, lattice matched growth. And this is you know, something that can be done. We have a preliminary linear response of these materials and, and this can be done. The important thing that I want to tell you here though is that if you think about, if you look at the bare cavity, this is, these are the, the optical properties of the bare cavity. In this case, where I have nothing, I have uh, whatever, something here, uh, say uh, a piece of glass. What you will find, this is the inverse patch width. So this is the, 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 the length of the, ca or the, the inverse length of the cavity. What I will find is a bare mode that disperses like so inside the cavity. But if I put now a superconductor in, this is what's, what was very exciting about these calculations that uh, we, are, we are about to publish, is that what you will find is that if you put a superconductor in which you have the Josephson mode in the superconductor, this will have an extremely strong coupling to the cavity mode. What you see here is a hybridization between the superconductor and the cavity mode. This is a, a what is it called, a quantum plasma polariton or something. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a situation in which you have a splitting and this splitting tells you how fast uh, energy floats between the superconductor and, uh, and uh, can, can sort of rotate. This is a Rabi frequency, will, sets a Rabi frequency and will tell you how fast the energy will go between the phase and the cavity mode. And this is what, what people call ultra strong coupling regime and this will be actually a very highly efficient way to do this and we have initial data that are a bit noisy but it indicate that this is possible. Now, yeah, an, an important thing is that maybe this may work with superconductors, but it could work with something else. It could work with, with ferroelectrics. We could cool other things. So this is, again, a work in progress. But, but I, I, what I want to, what I, you know, I, I went from some experiments that, that we're doing, and I, and I chose to show you things that we're working on that are not really uh, complete. But perhaps this gives you an idea of the complexity of the problem. You really need growth, you need high-end high optics, you need materials research. I'll be with you in a second, let me finish. And um, yeah, so this is kind of, you know, gives you a little bit of an idea of the breadth of, of, uh, of resources and, and, uh, and um, uh, yeah, conceptual ideas that, just clarify, yes. Just to, yeah. to un understand what, what you're saying here. Yes. This is theory up there. This is, yeah, this is a calculation. Assuming an ordered, assuming, ordered superconductor assuming the following system, a metal, which is niobium doped STO, an insulator, and then a thin layer of a superconductor with the planes along this axis, grown by MBE. Okay, this is, can below be... Below its transition. In the, exactly. In this case, it's below its transition. Exactly. What happened to your attempt to... To cool. We start below TC and then we go from there. So this is assuming that you're below TC. Precisely, precisely. Actually, point And what's important. the connection to to using uh, the same technique to lock the phase? Well, if you go above TC and you assume that there is a fluctuating phase. What you will have is that temporarily, if you think about this cavity mode, you may have a cavity mode that is closed on average, but temporarily will open and close as the, as the phase fluctuates. And maybe by putting, the, and by putting the light in, you should lock it. Actually, this is, this is an important point. But let's say that the zero order experiment will be to take a CW beam and stabilize phase fluctuations below TC. Wait, there aren't, there, they're, they're minuscule the phase are fluctuations they? below TC. Are they? Because you're below TC. I thought the phase fluctuations are what, what these... Uh, I don't know, because it depends what they're coupled to. I mean, if they're coupled to other degrees of freedom, I suppose. Okay. If they're coupled to other degrees of freedom, they will fluctuate. In any case, in any case. Those are kind of two separate. Uh, Let's say that the one is kind of a long term this ambition to try to lock fluctuating phases. And these are, you know, we're trying to get our head around this idea. I mean, you need to couple light to the phase and you need to do all these things. This? This, yeah. So that's, the, that's a little bit of the, yeah. I suppose, you know, look, uh, this, is, this is the stage that this is at, right? Okay, so um, 
anyway, so this is something, you know, I, I've sort of given you a little bit of a, of a cross-section of, of things that we're doing and, and new possibilities. And, 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 and I suppose one take-home message is that there's really sort of new, I'm going to read this, new opportunities that really the interface between optics, material science, and quantum physics, so including both theoretical and materials growth and, and, and various technological aspects of this and scientific. And it's about the idea of controlling non-equilibrium properties. This is what I've said, and I've given you some, some examples here. And, and uh, um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. I mean, real pictures of the, the laboratory. So no. I don't, I don't Would you have liked to see them? This, uh, um, I mean, how do you... Scale, in sense, how big is the collaboration? This is tabletop. How, how this, everything that I've talked about today is all tabletop. And this is... People are around the table. <laughs> <laughs> at any given time? <laughs> at any <laughs> given time or integrated? <laughs> For this type of things, there's maybe half a dozen people that are working. I mean, it's, I have also, I mean, other activities where we, we were working, for example, at the free electron lasers and things. What I've talked about today, let me think about this. What did I tell you? No, I didn't really, I told you about nonlinear phonics, that's like two or three people, rotonics, two people, and this, and this stuff, two people, half a dozen, plus me. And when you do the, the, the free electron laser, you go to a facility. You go to a facility and you have it all figured out in the lab, and then you have four days of beam time, and everybody's, you know, you start and... Uh, Nobody breathes for, for four days, so that's the, that's, that's, that's the, excuse me. Nobody sleeps. Either. Exactly, well that's for sure. But uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the, that's the, um, at least a fraction of it, but a fraction of our things. Any questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Andre again.